Good evening and welcome to Have I Got News For You. I'm Jeremy Clarkson, but don't worry, I won't be talking about cars. So climb aboard, fasten your seatbelts, let's get the show on the road. <laughs> Damn. In the news this week, after 150 sausages disappear from a butcher's in Leeds, security footage reveals the prime suspect. As the presents are unwrapped, it's another disappointing Christmas for the nephews and nieces of J.K. Rowling. <laughs> and in London, Ken Livingston accepts there may be a case for providing more street urinals. <laughs> On Ian's team, the chairman of Camelot, who has been mistaken for Jerry Springer. Not least by the researcher we asked to book some big names for this show. <laughs> Michael Grade. <laughs> On Paul's team, the woman who championed Winston Churchill as the greatest Briton, thus relegating my own choice of Isambard Kingdom Brunel into second place. Please welcome tonight's losing panellist, Mo Mola. <laughs> And we start, surprisingly, with round one. Ian and Jerry, what's this about? <laughs> oh, Geoffrey Robertson, the former postmaster general. He's in a car, that won't happen again. Um, <laughs> hello, there's Peter Mandelson. Yes, who he bankrolled for a house at one point. Nope, not a clue, sorry. <laughs> Geoffrey Robinson, he's a, a very, very rich man who was the paymaster general. He's, he's the owner of the New Statesman. Um, I think a number of senior Labour figures stayed in his holiday home. Which is nice. I didn't stand any of them. Really? Never invited. Andy, you're out the cabinet. Mm. <laughs> anyway, what's he been charged with? Failing to give a specimen. And no insurance. The police took away some suspicious substance. No, no, I have to be specific here. It wasn't suspicious, it was a mystery powder. A mystery powder? <laughs> it a mystery powder? <laughs> is it Beecham's? <laughs> Has he had a cold lately? <laughs> Could be dandruff. Could be dandruff. You yeah. must have worked with him. I didn't actually ever. You never worked with him? No. I was going to say, was he like, did he have dandruff or was he chatty? Um, <laughs> I never talked to him, so I can't give you a straight answer, I'm afraid. Because if he was chatty, we could have him on top gear. Yeah. <laughs> It'll take him a while, but I'll get there. He doesn't talk as much as you, Jeremy, I don't think. I haven't started yet. <laughs> <laughs> Why is this particularly embarrassing for John Prescott? Has he just introduced a drink drive campaign? He has. You'll get a £500 reward if you shop someone who is then subsequently convicted of drinking and driving. We don't know that he's been drinking. No, we don't know that he's been drinking. We, he could just have That's had the dandruff. That's the lawyer in me speaking. Yeah, and just weaving around the road trying to shake his dandruff off. <laughs> I'm glad it's you saying this, because it's not only Geoffrey Archer who's going to be spending Christmas Day. <laughs> Who do you think will be spending Christmas Day inside Geoffrey Archer? <laughs> <laughs> There's a guy in E-Wing that I've got my money on. <laughs> and, of course, uh, Robinson's not the only one who's been in trouble this week. Ian Duncan Smith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but not quite serious. the same sort of no. trouble. No, well, no. what's he been doing? Well, his entry in Who Who, they're so fed up with Labour sleeves. In what? Who's Who. Oh, Who's Who. You said, book. You said Who Who. <laughs> Who, who. Did I said who who? Yeah. Mm, yeah. I could have said who he. Yeah. <laughs> the question was, what's Ian Duncan Smith in trouble for this week? Education. Well, someone's gone through his who's who entry and found there are a few elaborations in there. For example, he said he was at the University of Perugia. Actually, he was at a foreign language school up the road in Perugia. There we are. What's the technical term for this? Oh, for doing life. an archer. Yeah. Archery. <laughs> 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 Uh, I've just got to read something out here. Robinson has denied all charges in any contact with any banned substance. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this is the news that the former Paymaster General has been arrested in connection with a suspected drink driving incident. Meanwhile, the government announced they're planning to introduce £40 fines for drivers caught using their mobile phones at the wheel. Although, if you're using it to report the bloke in front as a drunk driver, you're still 460 quid up. <laughs> Paul and Mo, your turn. Uh, it's Robert Winston. He was on last week. That's him. <laughs> uh, it's the inevitable march towards war. 
and but, totally uh, trying to get other ambassadors in the area yeah. on side yeah. because if not there'll be absolute chaos so who's he been talking to that was syria i think yeah president Assad. Assad. thank you <laughs> and what's his wife called Mrs. Asad. Bunty? Nope. Close. <laughs> She's from London, isn't she? Yeah. She's from Acton. Is yeah. it Sarah? Emma. Emma, sorry, yeah. Yeah, it's a secretary's name, that. <laughs> um... <laughs> Any Emmas in who don't want to agree with that? Oh, yeah, that'll be... Oh, just one. <laughs> Thank, yeah. you. Thank you, sir. That was the sound of a typo. <laughs> <laughs> How much is it costing to make British tanks battle ready? 85 quid per tank. More 90. <laughs> <laughs> Are they yeah. allergic to sand, these tanks? Then? What's the... Yeah, they get sand they get, in their the wheels filter. and in their... Ah. And, their... and the submarines. Do they not work? No, not in the desert. All... <laughs> no they're all in dry dock, because health and safety say they're dangerous. <laughs> they're meant to be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nuclear power hunter-killer submarine, this. Someone could get hurt. <laughs> In Saddam's dossier, what does Iraq thank Britain for? We sold them a super gun. Super glue. <laughs> and Superman. <laughs> we certainly sold them a lot of stuff. Fifteen UK companies that have assisted Iraq in building weapons of mass destruction. So that's how we know they're there, because we built them. <laughs> and what's Britain's official response to that? They haven't come out with a consistent answer. Tony said something, Jack Straw said something else, uh, and... Jeff Hoon said something different, so at the moment it's unclear what their response is. Are you suggesting the Labour front bench is in disarray? Ian, how could you say that when I've just said that? <laughs> the official response is, uh, the list of companies appears to be accurate. <laughs> <laughs> what did German scientists help the Iraqis with in 1988? making gas mm. to use against British troops? No, against the Kurds. You champion Churchill, who... Uh, who is a great man. Great man. He also gassed Kurds. Yes, he also did some rather unpleasant things with miners, suffragettes. Wasn't all good. No, you glossed over the Kurdish issue there, I they thought, in your programme. No, what I did say was with the miners who he took on, the We're not interested in the miners. We are, because they're, <laughs> they're the people Kurds of this now. country. And I admitted that he was sometimes heavy-handed, as he was with the Sydney Street anarchists. However, those I characteristics... I don't remember asking about the Sydney Street anarchists <laughs> and the no. well, I'm, just pointing, out, I I'm just pointing out the people... Well, you should care about them, Jeremy. You were narrow-minded. As are the Kurds, thanks to Churchill. <laughs> Um, but I did say that those characteristics which were negative in wartime, you need a leader with that determination and courage. So I didn't ignore the negatives completely, Mr Jeremy Clarkson. <laughs> Brunel should have won. <laughs> Ian and Michael, what's this about? Public enemy number one. These are hedgehogs. Well, that's a leap. You're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah, hedgehogs in the Hebrides um, uh, are uh, killing um, birds. What? These birds are very slow if they're being killed by hedgehogs. Aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> what are they doing? Just, <laughs> just lying there as the hedgehog nibbles their feet. <laughs> You're right. It's, uh, and they don't to... eat the birds, Paul. You're just being silly. They eat the eggs. Do? Ah. So the eggs aren't very fast. Ah, no. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. There are, as you say, 5,000 hedgehogs now. How many were there on these islands 30 years ago? 20 million. What? Is that the way you do your figures at Camelot? <laughs> <laughs> none. Of course, yeah. just got it. There were none. none. And then four were introduced in 1974. Yeah. Introduced. This is George. George, George Jack. George, <laughs> George Chris. Well, I hope it wasn't just George and Jack to turn it to <laughs> How will the hedgehogs be killed? Hard-boiled eggs. They're going to be shot. So are you ordering room service? <laughs> <laughs> no, you see, they take the eggs. They feed off the eggs of the birds. So what's hard boiling? If boil you hard boil them, they'll choke. Yeah. They <laughs> will. You've got them there. Well, you've got little paws. They might be able to slap each other on the back. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a sight worth filming, wouldn't it? Attenborough know that we're going to be giving yeah, boiled eggs to hedgehogs. Yeah, he's going to be boiling the eggs. Ah, well, there we are. Are they going to shoot them? 
shoot hedgehogs. Yeah, it wouldn't be difficult to catch them. They get them. to hunt them with dogs on Boxing Day morning. Dressed in pink. That would be a nice sight. Wouldn't it, Tony? <laughs> You could hit them with croquet mallets. <laughs> <laughs> so how are you going to kill them? Lethal injection. Lethal injection? <laughs> well, they just poison the sources of milk. Yeah. It's a complicated one. I don't, how do you find a pit to get your needle in? Because I'm used to this. And how do you know that you've already done? You, have, you might be doing the same one four times. You don't know. <laughs> it goes around a rock and they say, look, you go out there again. You're dead anyway. You might. <laughs> Give them the hard boiled eggs, is the only way. <laughs> the Independent, which is a newspaper, that's running a campaign to highlight the plight of which other animal? Uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> it's the sparrow. Ten million have yes. disappeared. I have a theory on why. A few years ago in the 1950s, a type of bird in Britain was nearly extinct. Mm -hmm. The RSPB had a bit of a thing to try and get it going yeah. again. There are now 64,000 of them. Sparrow hawks. Sparrow hawks. Uh, and what do sparrow hawks eat? Hawks. <laughs> Three sparrows a day. 64,000, so, well, say 70,000, 210,000 yeah, a happened, day. Isn't it? So we should actually be killing sparrow hawks. Yeah. Murdering them, throw hedgehogs at them. <laughs> this, um, no, yes. Yes, this is the <laughs> controversial plan to cull 5,000 hedgehogs in the Western Isles of Scotland because they prey on the eggs of seabirds. According to The Guardian, since the animals were introduced to the islands, the hedgehog population has exploded. <laughs> Most of them on bonfire night. <laughs> hedgehogs are, of course, the gardener's friend. They eat slugs, control the snail population, and they're good for getting the mud off your wellingtons. <laughs> Right, Paul and Mo make sense of this. Oh no, you don't. Uh, but this is Paul McCartney. He wants to uh, he wants to get an accurate uh, credit for all the Beatles songs because when him and John Lennon started off, they made a sort of agreement that they would just split, you know, call it Lennon and McCartney. Um, but he now says that sort of like it's not strictly accurate, and that he wants it to be more like sort of you know the songs that he chiefly wrote should be composed by Paul Mert uh, Paul Merton. Paul Merton. <laughs> <yeah. laughs> I gave a few hints. Generous of him. <laughs> I gave a few hints here and there, you know, rhyme for kaleidoscope, that sort of thing. And he says that um, they should be sort of composed by Paul McCartney and John Lennon, or John Lennon and Paul McCartney, depending on who did the majority of the work. And, and Yoko's saying, you know, you, you, you can't do this. Why has he waited this long? To oh, know? I don't know. Is it pillow talk, do you think? Are you suggesting his new wife is influencing him? Uh, it, uh, it's just um, extraordinary that it's sort of come up now. I mean, McCartney's version of events is that he arrived at a meeting years and years and years ago, Brian Epstein, John Lennon, and they said, we're going to call the songwriting Lennon and McCartney. And McCartney mm. said to them, can we change it later on? And they said, yeah, later on we might change it around. Do you think so, that happened with Marks and Spencers? Well, cool. it was going to be Mark, Spencer and Wilson, and Wilson didn't even turn up. So <laughs> <laughs> just completely cut out of it all the way. There's a Beatles picture doing the round on the... Um, this week, you've seen it? No, no, no. Oh, that's interesting. Who's that's, that in the top corner? That's uh, Michael Jackson. Michael yeah. Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Jackson owns the publishing rights to he these does. songs. He does. Yes. And then your uncle used to own the publishing rights. Yes. Luke, Luke Gray. <laughs> yes. Why did you tell them? Uh, got a very good offer at the time. Shut up about the Beatles now. <laughs> I haven't been talking about He's no, the you one that's been... <laughs> yes, well, I'm now taking charge of I've the situation One here. word about the Beatles, I get shut, shut up. Shut up! He's been talking about... <laughs> I know, he took me the unfair. final straw that very had broken unfair. the camel's back. It's very, very unfair. <laughs> Other legal action this week. Oh, yes, Trini and Susanna of uh, the, the, the what, what Are You Wearing show. Basically, a part-time lesbian. And they, um, <laughs> they, they, they use this programme to fondle women in public. Um, they've been parodied in Viz magazine, Viz comic, and they don't like this at all. And of all the people... Oh, they're not going to sue, are they? they, they they're, they're planning to, I think. Oh. And of all the people who have ever appeared in Viz as, you know, little sort of characters and stuff, they're the first who've ever said, <laughs> we're going to sue. And do you know what the Viz response is? I can guess. Laugh, I should guess. <laughs> yeah. We're too busy laughing to comment. <laughs> it's the latest row between Yoko Ono and Sir Paul McCartney after he changed the credit on many Beatle tracks from Lennon and McCartney to McCartney and Lennon. A lot of people agree that Lennon's name should not have been first, chiefly when Mark Chapman was writing his hit list. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
That's an interesting noise we hear there, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> it wasn't a laugh, it was a snake noise. Justifying his actions, Sir Paul told a newspaper, it's not demeaning John, it's merely pointing out who did the body of work on certain songs, just so people know. And, just so people know, the frog chorus was written exclusively by Paul McCartney. <laughs> And at the end of that round, a quick look at the scores shows us that Ian and Michael have nine, and trailing with eight are Paul and Mo. Ah. <laughs> round three is all about picking the odd one out. Ian and Michael, your four are Edmund Stoiber, Saurav Ganguly, Rod Stewart, and the stuffed sparrow of Lords. They've all played at Lords. What, Edmund Stoiber? Except the sparrow. There's no catch with this question. Was the sparrow killed by a cricket ball at a cricket match? And uh, that makes it the odd one out. Uh, <laughs> you're right. If a bird is the odd one out. Oh, yes, right. Um, because it was killed by a cricket ball. Yeah, they've all injured people with balls apart from the sparrow, which oh. was killed by a cricket ball, uh -huh. bowled by Indian medium pacer Jangir Khan during a match in 1936. What's Stoiber's contribution? He was on the uh, campaign trail against Gerhard Schroeder uh -huh. and kicked it for a photo opportunity, which is exactly what he got, because it ended up hitting a woman in the face. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a kick, isn't it? How did Surav Ganguly injure someone with a ball? I presume he sort of like, you know, took a huge, great big whack at it and uh, then hit somebody in, you know, the, the wicketkeeper. Mm. It flew up into his face, knocked his eye out, and the, uh, the third slip caught the eye. Uh, <laughs> it was rushed to hospital where it's now seeing friends. Uh, he hit something called a six during something <laughs> called the third test in August this year. Here we go. There we go. There it goes. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Now, that's quite a slow delivery, isn't it? <laughs> oh, that's standing on... Oh, dear. Oh, oh. oh dear. He made, a oh. he made a pretend to try and catch it, and then it landed on his... Oh, look at that. <laughs> Luckily, he had a bandage there, and it bounced off. <laughs> At a concert in Cardiff, Rod Stewart kicked a football into the crowd, which hit 47-year-old Steve Tudor, breaking his finger. Steve said it ruined the rest of the concert as he could no longer put it in his ear. <laughs> <laughs> Surav Ganguly has been a hero of Indian cricket for some time. According to one cricket website, a road in Rajarat in West Bengal has been named after him. In the same way as the current England side have had a famous creek named after them. <laughs> <laughs> Paul and Mo, your foursome R. Isambard Kingdom Brunel, the genius, the Statue of Liberty, Prince Charles and Sooty. Well, Sooty's clearly attacked Prince Charles, we can see that. There's the weapon. <laughs> I mean, is it an auction? They've all... Um, Sooty has bid for Prince Charles, an auction has won him for a year. <laughs> is it a French connection? Brunel's father was French. Mm -hmm. The Statue of Liberty was a gift from France. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Sooty's father um, was French, known as Sooty. <laughs> <laughs> Monsieur Sooty. Monsieur Sooty. <laughs> and Prince Charles is more on the German side. It's got nothing to do with the French. It involves a little sleight of hand. Uh, Izzy Wizzy, let's get busy. Magic wand. Uh, magic tricks. They all... Uh, Brunel, uh, he, was, he liked magic tricks. It was his parlour game. He used to, he used to, after building a bridge at day, he'd go and do some parlour tricks at night. Prince Charles, <laughs> he's, he's, he's in with the magic circle. And uh, he does special tricks. He makes things disappear. The Statue of Liberty is the odd one out. Oh, no, the Statue of Liberty was subject of a magic trick because um, somebody made it disappear, Houdini. didn't they? Houdini. Houdini did. No, not Houdini. Recently, it was the guy that... David Copperfield. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what happened at uh, a party when Brunel tried to make a coin disappear? He choked. You choked. were listening. He choked. He went in his lung. <laughs> now, most people, I think, when they got a coin stuck in their lung, would panic. Not Isambard Kingdom, Brunel. <laughs> he died. No. <laughs> he invented artery faucets and then got his father to give him a tracheotomy to pull the coin out. And that didn't work, so then he invented a physio table and they jiggled him if around. If you got that in the out. film, he would have won. That was in the film. <laughs> <laughs> According to the published statistics, the Statue of Liberty has a 426-inch waist, or, as Americans call it, medium. <laughs>
<laughs> in the 1830s, Isambard Kingdom Brunel designed the Clifton Suspension Bridge in wow. Bristol. And even wow. today, people stand on the breathtaking piece of engineering point in wow. awe and say, aren't those the flat Cherie Blairbord? <laughs> <laughs> and the scores have moved on, so and Michael have 10, and Paul and Mo, annoyingly from my point of view, have 12. <laughs> Now, this is, of course, the time of year when the army of alcoholics who work on newspapers, magazines and TV programmes all resort to filling space with unimaginative quizzes about the year just gone. So, fingers on the buzzers. <laughs> What's happened to the waxwork of Ian Duncan Smith at Madame Tussauds? Well, He's become leader of the Conservative Party. <laughs> <laughs> No. Not already. Been removed. No. Defaced. No. It's grown hair. No. <laughs> it started weeping. No. They, <laughs> they put a string in his back. You pull it, and he goes. <coughs> <laughs> the answer is nothing. <laughs> How did you get these exclusive stories? <laughs> Do yeah, you they want would. to know why nothing has happened to it? Because he's there, not in there. There isn't one. There isn't one. Well, there is the, he's the first leader of the opposition ever not to have a waxwork in Madame Tussauds. Are you in there, mate? <laughs> I don't think so, no. Are well, you, Jeremy? No, there isn't enough wax. <laughs> Next, what rendered George Bush unconscious... A long book. <laughs> no, it's a short book. No, it's a pretzel. There you go. It was an Al Qaeda targeted it. pretzel. Absolutely. It was the corner of a table after he choked on a pretzel. <laughs> so he had a pretzel, then he had a corner of a table, then he <laughs> fell over. <laughs> well, according to a White House doctor, Mr. Bush sustained a small cut on his cheek and bruised his lip before he finally managed to get the pretzel in his mouth. <laughs> Have I lost my job now? <laughs> no, it's going well. No, that Canadian yeah. woman, that Alistair Campbell in Canada, who's a woman, she mm. lost her job because she called Bush a moron. Or is it an official secret? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what does that mean for when he gets to... Oh, OK. Do we believe he's capable of doing anything intelligent when he gets there? Do we think there's a laugh coming somewhere in a minute? <laughs> no, I'm just so disappointed and depressed if we do go to war. Yes, Sorry. but, hey, it's nearly Christmas, isn't it? No, but I, if we have to... Let's opportunity... see if we can cheer everyone up in the Every opportunity, every opportunity... <laughs> every opportunity... We're all going to die! <laughs> I just think every opportunity I can, I just say we shouldn't do it. Mm. I don't think we're going to die, though. I think other people are going to die. That's the point of it. Yeah, it? I live in Chipping Norton. That's definitely not on his list. Well, you shouldn't have advertised that, should yeah. you? <laughs> next. Where this year did Michael Crawford find himself standing next to Margaret Thatcher? Uh, that must be the Great Britain's list. Ooh, it was. He was 17th, she was 16th in the absurdly rigged BBC poll. <laughs> Next, what do Jeremy Paxman's colleagues get from him every Wednesday without fail? A ma mandarin orange. You haven't pressed the buzzer. Press the buzzer. Now say it. Grapefruit. No. <laughs> it has nothing to do with fruit. OK, uh, they get a weekly joke, uh, which he sends to Newsnight staff. Here's the latest, good. OK. Um, good King Wenceslas last went into a well-known pizza parlour. The usual, sir, said the waiter. Yes, said Good, Gwyn uh, good King Wenceslas last. Deep pan, crisp and even. <laughs> and he won't do this show, apparently. <laughs> He's been asked. He has been asked. He, he won't, won't be asked it. again, though. <laughs> <laughs> He's missed his chance. And what record was by Elvis Smith of the Turks and Caicos Islands at the Commonwealth Games? Was he the slowest swimmer? No. Is he the lowest high jumper? No. The shortest lowest, long jumper? Lowest pole vaulter. Field or track? It's, um, I'm not an athletics person, I'm going to say field, although that might be wrong. <laughs> 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 he 
it's the javelin. It is the javelin. It is the javelin. <laughs> what did so, he do? He, he caught he, it. He, he... <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, what's happened is he achieved a personal worst at the javelin. It's a shame, isn't it? Yeah, I feel sorry for him, do you? Yeah, I do, yeah. Good laugh, though. <laughs> <laughs> what did Bill Clinton get in Blackpool this year? Yes. He got an ovation. Standing ovation. He got a standing ovation. Did you get a standing ovation when you last went? Yes, the one before I left, yes. How did that go down with the front bench? Well, if I was them, I wouldn't have liked it, and I don't think they did like it very much. <laughs> and Tony said it didn't bother him. But it obviously bothered... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it obviously bothered somebody at number 10 who started leaking to the press that I was brain-dead. Mm. Not, not that the audience was brain-dead. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> well, if Clinton gets a standing ovation, what do you have to do? Bill Clinton <laughs> opened his speech to the Labour Party conference by stating categorically, I've never been to Blackpool before and I've never been to McDonald's in Blackpool before. <laughs> So people began to doubt him when he added, I did not have chips with that burger. <laughs> At one point during his speech in Blackpool, Clinton simply said, 9, 11. And then paused for effect. Uh, the effect, however, was somewhat spoilt when someone at the back shouted, House! <laughs> That brings us to the end of tonight's contest, and the final scores are as follows. Ian and Michael, you have 11, and Paul and Mo, you have 16. Yeah. And I'll leave you with news that profits are down for high street retailers, as another key group of shoppers turns to the internet for their gifts. <laughs> The demonic mind responsible for the Wandsworth one-way system is finally revealed. <laughs> and as the pension shortfalls begin to bite, the government hands out a one-off gift to enable the aged to do their bit. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>